That's me. This is Lana the Llama Corn. Benny's somewhere. Welcome to the show. Lana, are you ready for another interview? Miles wants to know, where were you born? Well, I was born on a planet really far away, and I'm not supposed to tell you the name, but if you ask me one more time, I might tell you. Catherine and Melissa want to know, why is your fur pink? Well, Melissa and Catherine, um, basically um, everybody on my planet has a different color fur and you get to pick and I pick pink um, because pink reminds me of flowers and also pink reminds me of cotton candy. Also, that's how I found Miss Saxon, because she was the pinkest thing on earth. Wow. Well, I'm glad you found me. Uh, Rose wants to know how old are you? I'm 70 million years old. Michelle wants to know, can you make her pink sparkly wool scarf with magical powers? Michelle, that's a great question. Llama corns can make scarves just like regular llamas. Um, and yes, they are colorful, but if you would like to have a magical scarf, uh, you have to say the magic words and sing a magic song, and you can learn the magic song from me if you want. Wow, I've actually always wanted to know this. Brooke wants to know, can you fly? Oh my goodness, Brooke, I wish I could fly every day, but unfortunately, I'm not a, a Pegasus llama corn, but my, my dad was. Your dad can fly? Wow, I wonder if my dad can fly. Huh. All right, next. Brooke wants to know, what do you eat for breakfast? I know the answer to this. You know what I have for breakfast? I have Fruity Pebbles every morning, and that's exactly what Miss Saxon needs for breakfast every morning. Mmm, yum, 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 yum. Fruity Pebbles every day. Gluten-free. Steve wants to know, that's my that's my dad, Steve. Are you friends with an alien named Meeby Deep from Barney and Outer Space? You know, Steve, I have not made friends with that alien yet. Uh, do you know what planet that alien lives on? Sounds very colorful. My friend Marlo wants to know, will you bring her boy chocolate? Marlo, I'm sorry, I only have girl chocolate. Darn. What is up with that spaceship behind you? Whose spaceship is that? Is that your spaceship? Well, yes, um, this isn't my spaceship. This is my friend's spaceship. My spaceship's battery is out right now. I need to go get a jump. Um, do you know where I can get a battery for a spaceship like that? No, I have no. I have no idea. Oh, well, okay. That's not very helpful, but. Last but not least, Lana, what song would you like to hear? Um, I wanna listen to Octopus's Garden by the Beatles. Make sure you sing along, otherwise, what's the point? Garden in the shade. 
geography. Today we're going to again randomly pick a place to study. We've got National Geographic's Atlas of the World, my favorite book. We're gonna put it in our lap, open it up to a random page. One, two, three, go. Whoa. The title of this page is Greece. Well, first of all, a lot was going on in Greece thousands of years ago. The Aegean Sea is full of a ton of little islands. I myself went to an island called Mykonos. Oh, I found it, Mykonos. Gosh, it's fun to say these names. Boruyur Sporadius. Thessaloniki. Oh, I've heard of that before. Greece is in Europe. Apparently its official name is the Hellenic Republic. Its capital is Athens. It has a population of 10,761,523. The official language is Greek. So get this, Greece has the longest coastline in all of Europe. And you know why? Because of all the tiny little islands. The Aegean Sea, the Ionian Sea, and the Mediterranean Sea bordering it. Mount Olympus is Greek's highest point, and Mount Olympus is the place where the ancient Greeks thought that the gods lived. Maybe they did live there. Who am I to say? The first great civilization in Greece was over 4,000 years ago. In the time of 2000 BCE on the island of Crete, and it was the first great civilization of Greece. It was called the Minoan culture, M-I-N-O-A-N. -N. Eventually though, the ancient, the ancient Greek area was divided into a few different places. Athens, Sparta, Thebes, and Corinth. Athens became the most powerful in around 500 BCE, which is 2,500 years ago, 2,500 years ago. They invented democracy. True, but during that time, only the men could vote. Greece also invented the Olympic Games. The very first Olympic Games were held in 700 BCE to honor Zeus, but only men could compete and the events were just sprinting, long jump, discus, javelin, wrestling, and chariot racing. The Greek gods and goddesses are super cool to learn about. One of the goddesses is named Aphrodite, She's the goddess of love and beauty. She's the subject of this painting called The Birth of Venus by Botticelli. Athena. Athena was the goddess of reason and wisdom and war. She famously sprung fully formed from the forehead of Zeus. Artemis is the goddess of the hunt. Ares, god, god of bloodlust and war. Athena was the more noble aspect of war. Ares was like the, I wanna kill you kind of war. Apollo. Apollo was really the most, imp one of the most important ones because he was the god of wisdom. He was also very feared because he, cause he was smarter than everyone else. Demeter. Demeter was the agricultural goddess, so she would be protecting your plants. Dionysus was the god of, um, Dionysus was the god of like birthday parties. Hades. Hades is the god of the dead. He rules the, the underworld, so he makes sure they stay down there. But he also ushers them down there. There's lots of different places to live in the underworld. It's not all bad. Hera was uh, the sister and wife of Zeus, and she was the goddess of the home. Hera had plenty to be mad about because Zeus was always running off to Earth. Hermes is the god of music he, and, and luck and deception, and he was really, really fast, and so he was a messenger. Poseidon is the god of the sea with a trident. And of course, last but not least, Zeus. He was the chief god, but the way that Zeus became the chief god was with his two brothers, Hades and Poseidon. He overthrew his father, Kronos, who was a titan, and he was very large. Oh, also, Zeus controls the weather and like whether or not the sun comes up and stuff like that. So you can see how he might be like the most important God. Why is the, why is the lightning burn out my house? Zeus. Why is it flooding? Zeus. I know an old lady who swallowed a fly. I don't know why she swallowed the fly. Perhaps she'll die. I Bird, how absurd to swallow a bird. 
fly. I don't know why she swallowed the fly. Perhaps she'll die. I know an old lady who swallowed a cat. Imagine that to swallow a cat. She swallowed the cat to catch the bird. She swallowed the bird to catch the spider that wriggled and jiggled and tickled inside her. She swallowed the spider to catch the fly. I don't know why she swallowed the fly. Perhaps she'll die. I know an old lady who swallowed a dog. What a hog to swallow a dog. She swallowed the dog to catch the cat. She swallowed the cat to catch the bird. She swallowed the bird to catch the spider that wriggled and jiggled and tickled inside her. She swallowed the spider to catch the fly. I don't know why she swallowed the fly. Perhaps she'll die. I know an old lady who swallowed a goat. She opened her throat and in walked the goat. She swallowed the goat to catch the dog. She swallowed the dog to catch the cat. She swallowed the cat to catch the bird. She swallowed the bird to catch the spider that wriggled and jiggled and tickled inside her. She swallowed the spider to catch the fly. I don't know why she swallowed the fly. Perhaps she'll die. I know an old lady who swallowed a cow. I don't know how she swallowed a cow. She swallowed a cow to catch the goat. She swallowed the goat to catch the dog. She swallowed the dog to catch the cat. She swallowed the cat to catch the bird. She swallowed the bird to catch the spider that wriggled and jiggled and tickled inside her. She swallowed the spider to catch the fly. I don't know why she swallowed the fly. Perhaps she'll die. I know an old lady who swallowed a horse. She's dead, of course. Have you ever swallowed a horse, Lana? Of course she has a look at her, she's tiny. Hi, it's me, Alex. Now it's time for another art history lesson. Hope that you all enjoyed learning about Joseph Cornell. Here's one of his little boxes on my cute little book. Um, I'm now gonna show you some of the assignments uh, that people return to me through picture. So here we have a few examples of people's boxes. I know we have one from Zoe, and I know we have one from Katya. So if you want to make a box still, just go back to last week's episode, watch and learn, and then make a box. Um, this box is a, about you know, being in different places at once, under the sea and on top of a mountain. I'm gonna leave it here where we can all see it the whole lesson because I'm proud of it. How about that? Now, I'd like to turn your attention to a super cool artist named Hilma Off Clint. Here's a book I have about her. Hilma was a really, really cool lady. Um, I'm a fan of hers because of all of her colors and of her big paintings. Before I tell you a little bit about Hilma, I want you to see some of her paintings. So some of these really big ones that are my favorite are ones like this. These are two of my absolute favorite paintings by her. They have gold in them. They have triangles, they have circles. They're a bit abstract, but they're not totally abstract. Hilma was born on October 26, 1862. Uh, she died on October 21st, 1944. That means she lived to be 82 years old. She lived in Stockholm, Sweden. She went to school at a place called Tekniska Skolan. When she was a child, she spent a lot of time outside, which you'll find becomes important later. And her interests included mathematics and botany, which apparently the rest of her family was also interested in too. Math is important to her just noticing where math is in the world, and then botany, so botany means like plants, and flowers, and trees, and things like that, being able to identify them. She graduated from art school in 1887. That was exactly 100 years before I was born. 1896 is when she started to incorporate uh, her spiritual life into her painting. I didn't tell you, but her sister Hermina died in 1880, so around that time, she started to get interested in what was called spiritism. She thought that if you talk to the spirits, that they could communicate stuff from up there about down here, as in, well, why are roses red and what's the meaning of life? So she started to talk to the spirits in the spirit world and apparently they would tell her things and that's the stuff she started to paint. Finally, in 1906, she, she began her first real abstract art where she kind of wasn't trying to paint anything from this world, but instead was kind of making it all up in her head. And she started coming up with visual language or the visual vocabulary. It means there were things that were repeated in her art. 
So her visual vocabulary, visual language was a set of symbols or, or pictures. When she put them into her paintings, it always meant the same thing. Each of these visual symbols had a meaning for her. And so together, if you put all these symbols together, they meant something special to her. Now she had translations of all of these, her visual vocabularies in her little notebooks. I haven't looked at all of them, but you can, um, but you have to go to the museum to find them. Uh, first of these huge works, the first one, is blue and it has a lot of flowers and it's really pretty and it's huge. It's t way taller than me. It's about twice the height of me. Um, more flowers. So we're getting that this like she's gonna repeat flowers and she's gonna repeat circles. You, these next two are called youth and the change is from into an orange background. Still a lot of blue and pink. Still a lot of flowers. Still a lot of circles. You can see that all of these symbols are getting repeated. Now we have the purple background, still a lot of flowers, still a lot of circles. Even when it's not a flower, it's a circular shape. Now we have this really dominant yellow figure in the middle. This is the cover of the book. It's one of her most famous paintings. It's combining the circles and the flowers. So if you see here, there's this um, repeated sort of art. Uh, what it makes your eyes want to do is kind of follow it around in its path and its orbit, which is like often very, you know, you kind of think of circles when you think of going around in orbit, right? And yet, it brings you up towards these petals, right? So it's blending this circular, circular motion with the botany of her, um, of her childhood. Oh wow! And this must be significant too, because in this all this whole series of paintings, we have yet to see squares. When you look at all of the um, the work of an artist and you see things that are repeated and then you see things that are out of the ordinary that's when you know that oh this painting probably means something different so let's look at the title the title is old age <laughs> so everything else is kind of young and youthful and and what it makes me think of is in old age everything becomes a little bit more rigid right it has to fit but ooh, look at this this reminds me of a pair of lungs i'm going to show you a couple more this is another it's a it's a one that looks like a flower but it also looks like a butterfly at the same time right and inside the flower are the two loops. Her colors are often always the same, right? It's reds and pinks and oranges and then, and then blues and blacks. And of course you get purples and you get greens, but they're always kind of highlighting things. They're not really the featured colors. And then yellow, so it's a lot of red, blue, and yellow. Another thing she starts to play with as, a, um, as opposed to circles is um, kind of like pulling apart the circles. So that's actually the shape of DNA. This double helix, right, of going around, which funnily enough is when we were talking about orbits earlier, because we're orbiting around the sun and we're moving through space, we're actually making the shape of a double helix as we go through the universe. We're not just stationary. The sun isn't stationary, right? The sun is moving through the universe as well. We're, we're moving through the universe the sun, with the sun. So as we orbit it, we kind of, we, we're moving with it. Pretty cool, right? Maybe she knew that. Maybe the spirits told her that. I don't know. I think it's pretty cool. I prepared just a little drawing activity for you if you're interested in it. My paper is a square, okay? But um, it's actually not even a perfect square. Start by drawing a circle around the middle of your paper. A very small circle, okay? And then you're going to add to the circle. And then draw another circle around that circle, okay? And the colors do not matter. You can draw whatever, you can use whatever colors you want, but because Helm Aquan was like pretty colorful, I'm gonna just use all my colors. Do another circle around that circle, and I'm gonna do a total of seven circles because my favorite number is seven. We're just basically copying the spirit of Helm Aquan because her paintings are so pretty and they make me feel so happy. But sometimes I just like to copy things just to have fun. But it's also fun to copy it in your own way, to not copy exactly, but to just be inspired. So I've got seven circles and they're not perfect and that doesn't matter, it's fine. Go back to the middle of your circle, of your very first circle, and I want you to draw two lines down. Okay? These two lines are gonna make um, like a pathway, just like that one painting that we saw. And then, Finish out the rest of your triangle with a, with more steps towards the, the middle of that circle. I think that looks kind of cool. On one side, I thought we could do the double helix. So um, start with just one color and just start with a squiggly line. That's 
and then get a different color and do squiggly line opposite, right? So it's like opposite, 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 opposite. Can you tell how that's opposite? Then I thought for the rest of it, we would um, use some of Helma's visual vocabulary and just copy them and, and have them decorate the rest of the page. So one of the things she did was like a fern frond. That, like it's a clover shape, but it was always three. And as we're doing this art lesson, you can just pause if you want to copy it or you can add it anywhere you want. So I added this one, a little clover. Hmm. Another one she had is a, a, a looks like a flower, but it's got and it's got four petals, and then it's got four more petals, perfectly on the outside. So my mathematicians will love this. She also also always had like a bit of an infin thing for the infinity symbol, and then a couple of her paintings like that. A couple of her paintings I saw her do this as well, like circle the infinity symbol. So it was like looks like two little beans. Ooh, and this is a simple one. It's, it's like an elongated infinity that comes to a point. So it looks like this. It starts off like this, okay? It's like a sharp infinity. And then like this, and then like this. See? An oval infinity. And then this one is really simple. It's, um, it's just six circles, or no, seven circles, with one in the middle. Okay, so you have to have one in the middle, and then the rest go like this. One, two, three, four, five, six. Seems simple, but it just like combined with all the rest of them, just looks super cool. It looks so cool, I'm gonna add another one. Oh, no, I can't, because I forgot, especially for my friend Katya. She's gonna love this. Um, she um, often also liked letters, and some letters meant some other things, and so, she really liked U's and W's, and so I know you guys like that ooh woo or whatever. So if you add some like ooh woos in there, <laughs> I don't know what it means. And then just because I made these, I made all these symbols, you notice that this area right here looks empty and this area looks right here looks empty. So the artist in me wants to do this. I don't know why, but I'm doing it because that's, I just had a calling. That's what it told me to do. And that's okay. I feel like that's what Helma Offklint did, you know? Like, she probably just started painting and she just listened to herself. And I think probably a lot of us are told, don't listen to yourself or whatever your first instinct may or may not be right. But when you're making art, just make whatever you want. So my plan for this is to color it in, okay? And I thought it'd be really cool to color the, um, to color the different parts of the circles, like a rainbow basically, but then when it got to the middle, maybe change the colors. So I'm gonna color it in, and then I'm gonna show you next week um, what I did. But this is the outline, and if you wanna make like a different type, if you wanna make different symbols, that's totally fine. Um, you can look at some more of her symbols online. Um, and if you don't, if you wanna just do whatever you want, that's fine too. Just share it so I can put it on the on the screen for everyone, okay? I hope you have fun making your Helma Offklint uh, drawings. I had fun sharing it with you. Um, I'm gonna color mine in with my crayons. Bye. On top of spaghetti, all covered with cheese. I lost my poor me. When somebody sneezed, Achoo! it rolled off the table and onto the floor. And then my poor meatball rolled out of the door. It rolled in the tree
was a cavern in beautiful moss. It grew great big meatballs and tomato sauce. So if you eat spaghetti all covered with cheese, hold on to your to your meatball and don't ever sneeze. Hi, it's me, Alex. Welcome back to Miss Saxon's No School Show. Uh, right now we're going to continue reading Ozma of Oz. We're on chapter two. Chapter two is titled The Yellow Hen. Last chapter, Dorothy fell off of a boat that was traveling to Australia because there was a big storm, but she floated away in a chicken coop and that's the last we heard of her. All right, ready for chapter two? Okay. There seems to be something wrong with my book. Oh, I'm wearing the wrong glasses. Here we go. <clears throat> the yellow hen. A strange noise awoke Dorothy, who opened her eyes to find that day had dawned and the sun was shining brightly in a clear sky. She had been dreaming that she was back in Kansas again and playing in the old barnyard with the calves and pigs and chickens all around her. And at first, as she rubbed the sleep from her eyes, she really imagined she was there. Here again was the strange noise that had awakened her. Surely it was a hen cackling, but her but her wide open eyes first saw through the slats of the coop the blue waves of the ocean, now calm and placid, and her thoughts flew back to the past night, so full of danger and discomfort. Also, she began to remember that she was a waif of, a waif of the storm, adrift upon a treacherous and unknown sea. What's that? cried Dorothy, starting to her feet. Why, I've just laid an egg, that's all, replied a small but sharp and distinct voice. And looking around her, the little girl discovered a yellow hen squatting in the opposite corner of the coop. Dear me, she exclaimed in surprise. Have you been here all night too? Of course, answered the hen, fluttering her wings and yawning. When the coop blew away from the ship, I clung fast to this corner with claws and beak, for I knew if I fell into the water, I'd surely be drowned. Indeed, I nearly drowned, as it was with all that water washing over me. I never was so wet before in my life. Yes, agreed Dorothy. It was pretty wet for a time, I know, but do you feel comfortable now? Not very. The sun has helped me to dry my feathers as it has your dress, and I feel better since I laid my morning egg. But what's to become of us, I should like to know, afloat on this big pond? I'd like to know that too, said Dorothy. But tell me, how does it happen that you're able to talk? I thought hens could only cluck and cackle. Why? As for that, answered the yellow hen thoughtfully, I've clucked and cackled all my life and never spoken a word for this morning that I can remember. But when you asked a question a minute ago, it seemed the most natural thing in the world to answer you. So I spoke and I seem to keep on speaking just as you and other human beings do. Strange, isn't it? Very, replied Dorothy. If we were in the land of Oz, I wouldn't think it so strange because many of the animals can talk in that fairy country. But out here in the ocean must be a good long way from Oz. How is my grammar? asked the yellow hen anxiously. Do I speak quite properly in your judgment? Yes, said Dorothy. You do very well for a beginner. I'm glad to know that, continued the yellow hen in a confidential tone, because if one is going to talk, it's best to talk correctly. The red rooster has often said that my cluck and my cackle were quite perfect, and now it's a comfort to know I am talking properly. I'm beginning to get hungry, remarked Dorothy. It's breakfast time, but there's no breakfast. You may have my egg, said the yellow hen. I don't care for it, you know. Don't you want to hatch it? Asked the little girl in surprise. No, indeed. I never care to hatch eggs unless I have a nice snug nest in some quiet place with a baker's dozen of eggs under me. That's 13, you know, and it's a lucky number for hens. So you may as well eat this one. Oh, I could possibly eat it unless it was cooked, exclaimed Dorothy but I'm much obliged for your kindness, just the same. Don't mention it, my dear, answered the hen calmly and began pruning her feathers. For a moment, Dorothy stood looking out over the wide sea. 
She was still thinking of the egg, though, so she presently asked, so presently she asked, Why do you lay eggs if you don't expect to hatch them? It's a habit I have, replied, replied the yellow hen. It has always been my pride to lay a fresh egg every morning, except when I'm molting. I never feel like having my morning cackle till the egg is properly laid, and without the chance to cackle, I would not be happy. It's strange, said the girl reflectively, but as I'm not a hen, I can't be expected to understand that. Certainly not, my dear. Then Dorothy fell silent again. The yellow hen was some company and a bit of comfort too, but it was dreadfully lonely out on the big ocean, nevertheless. After a time, the hen flew up and perched upon the topmost slat of the coop, which was a little above Dorothy's head. And when she was sitting upon the bottom, as she had been doing for some moments past, Why, we are not far from land, exclaimed the hen. Where, where is it? cried Dorothy, jumping up in great excitement. Over there a little way, answered the hen, nodding her dead nodding her head in a certain direction. We seem to be drifting toward it, so that before noon we ought to find ourselves upon dry land again. I shall like that, said Dorothy with a little sigh, for her feet and legs were still wetted now and then by the sea water that came through the open slats. So shall I, answered her companion. There is nothing in the world so miserable as a wet hen. The land, which they seemed to be rapidly approaching, since it grew more distinct every minute, was quite beautiful as viewed by the little girl in the floating hen coop. Next to the water was a broad beach of white sand and gravel, and farther back were several rocky hills, while beyond these appeared a strip of green trees that marked the edge of the forest. But there were no houses to be seen, no sign of any people who might inhabit this unknown land. I hope we shall find something to eat, said Dorothy, looking eagerly at the pretty beach toward which they drifted. It's long, back, it's long past breakfast time now. I'm a trifle hungry myself, declared the yellow hen. Why don't you eat the egg? asked the child. Why, you don't, you don't need to have your food cooked as I do. Do you take me for a cannibal? cried the hen indignantly. I do not know what I have said or done that leads you to insult me. I beg your pardon. I'm sure Mrs. Mrs. By the way, may I inquire your name, ma'am? asked the little girl. My name is Bill, said the yellow hen somewhat gruffly. Bill? Why, that's a boy's name. What difference does that make? You're a lady hen, aren't you? Of course, but when I first hatched out, no one could tell whether I was going to be a hen or a rooster. So the little boy at the farm where I was born called me Bill and made a pet of me because I was the only yellow chicken in the whole brood. When I grew up, he found that I didn't crow and fight as all the other roosters do. He did not think to change my name and every creature in the barnyard as well as the people in the house knew me as Bill. So Bill I've always been called, and Bill is my name. But it's all wrong, you know, declared Dorothy earnestly, and if you don't mind, I shall call you Belina. Putting the Ina on the end makes it a girl's name, you see. Oh, I don't mind it in the least, returned the yellow hen. It doesn't matter at all what you call me, so long as I know my name means me. Very well, Belina. My name is Dorothy Gale, just Dorothy to my friends and Miss Gale to strangers. You may call me Dorothy if you like. We're getting very near the shore. Do you suppose it is too deep for me to, to wade the rest of the way? Wait a few minutes longer. The sunshine is warm and pleasant, and we are in no hurry. But my feet are all wet and soggy, said the girl. My dress is dry enough, but I won't feel real comfortable until I get my feet dried. She waited, however, as the hen advised. And before long, the big wooden coop grated gently on the sandy beach, and the dangerous voyage was over. It did not take the castaways long to reach the shore, you may be sure. The, the yellow hen flew to the sands at once, but Dorothy had to climb over the high slats. Still, for a country girl, that was not much of a feat. And as soon as she was safe ashore, Dorothy drew off her wet shoes and stockings and spread them upon the sun-warm beach to dry. Then she sat down and watched Belina, who was pick-pecking away with her sharp bill in the sand and gravel, which she scratched up and turned over with her strong claws. "'What are you doing?' asked Dorothy." Getting my breakfast, of course, murmured the hen, busily pecking away. What do you find? inquired the girl curiously. Oh, some fat red ants and some sand bugs, and once in a while a tiny crab. They are very sweet and nice, I assure you. How dreadful, exclaimed Dorothy in a shocked voice. What is dreadful? asked the hen, lifting her head to gaze with one bright eye at her companion. Why, eating live bugs and, and live things and horrid bugs and crawly ants. You ought to be ashamed of yourself. "'Goodness me!' returned the hen in a puzzled tone. "'How strange you are, Dorothy. 
Live things are much fresher and more wholesome than dead ones, and you humans eat all sorts of dead creatures. We don't, said Dorothy. You do indeed, answered Bellina. You eat lambs and sheep and cows and pigs and even chickens. But we cook them, said, answered Dorothy triumphantly. What difference does that make? A good deal, said the girl in a graver tone. I can't just explain the difference, but it's there. And anyhow, we never eat such dreadful things as bugs. But you eat the chickens that eat the bugs, retorted the yellow hen with an odd cackle. So you are just as bad as we chickens are. This made Dorothy thoughtful. What Bellina said was true enough, and it almost took away her appetite for breakfast. As for the yellow hen, she continued to peck away at the sand busily, and seemed quite contented with her bill of fare. Finally, down near the water's edge, Bellina stuck her dip bill deep into the sand and then drew back and shivered. Ow! she cried. I struck metal that time and it nearly broke my neck. It probably was a rock, said Dorothy carelessly. Nonsense! I know a rock from metal, I guess, said the hen. There's a different feel to it. But there couldn't be any metal on this wild, deserted seashore, persisted the girl. Where's the place? I'll dig it up and prove to you I'm right. Bellina showed her the place where she had stubbed her bill as she expressed it and Dorothy dug away in the sand until she felt something hard. Then, thrusting her hand, she pulled the thing out and discovered it to be a large-sized golden key, rather old but still bright and of perfect shape. "'What did I tell you?' cried the hen with a cackle of triumph. "'Can I tell metal when I bump into it, or is the thing a rock?' "'It is metal, sure enough,' answered the child, gazing thoughtfully at the curious thing she had found. "'I think it's pure gold, and it must have lain hidden in the sand for a long time.' How do you suppose it came there, Bellina? And what do you suppose the mysterious key unlocks? I can't say, replied the hen. You ought to know more about locks and keys than I do. Dorothy glanced around. There was no sign of any house in that part of the country, and she reasoned that every key must fit a lock, and every lock must have a purpose. Perhaps the key had been lost by somebody who lived far away, but had wandered on this very shore. Musing on these things, the girl put the key in the pocket of her dress and then slowly drew on her shoes and stockings which the sun had fully dried. I believe, Belina, she said, I'll have a look round and see if I can find some breakfast. Thanks for tuning in to this week's episode of Miss Saxon's No School Show. Tune in next week to find out what happens to the yellow hen and Dorothy. I have a feeling it's not going to be a walk in the park. Bye!